information in order to access your audio, but there's still a button in which you would have to click in order to access it. We're going to have a segment down at the Q and A uh, towards the end of the presentation where you can use your microphones and be unmuted if you have questions or feel free to use the chat box if necessary. Um, so, uh, but as of right now, we're asking you to kind of fold your questions. Um, if you want to utilize the chat, if you just kind of want to shoot one off in there while people are speaking, then we can come back and circle back to it later. But as for right now, we request that once you have audio permission and privileges of you and you have connected your audio to then put yourself on mute. Um, but I think we can move forward then. Okay. Well. Thank you, Maggie. That was Maggie Songster. She is um, a specialist in the office of the sustainability office, um, a conservation uh, specialist for us. Uh, my name is Mike Wharton. I am the sustainability officer with Athens Clark County Unified Government and welcome to the clean and renewable energy action plan town hall meeting. This is the fifth of five. Um, we also have a survey that we're going to keep plugging throughout this presentation. Um, you'll also see on the screen with us um, some folks from the South Face Institute, who's a consulting partner with uh, this project, and from Green, Le Green Links Analytics. And they'll introduce themselves, since I obviously stumble over introductions, they'll introduce themselves as they come on as well. Um, so you'll, um, let's switch to the next slide. At today's meeting, we're also uh, joined by a community advisory board. This board was set up by the mayor to help inform and advise the development and implementation of the clean energy plan. Uh, Michael Songster is one of the members um, representing his group of 100% Athens. Other members that we have on the clean and renewable uh, on the uh, community uh, advisory board or action incorporated Georgia Green Building Council, Athens Housing Authority, the Athens Area Home Builders Association, Athens Land Trust, Athens Technical College, East Athens Development Corporation, Northeast Georgia Building Council, and WNA Engineering. We also have a, a quite a number of Athens Clark County staff in various departments who help as well in providing expertise and information to help plan, um, advise this plan. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so starting with the passage of the 100% Clean and Renewable Energy Resolution in 2019 by the Mayor and Commission, Athens Clark County has been committed to helping move the community toward a cleaner and healthier energy future. This includes moving the government owned and operated facilities to cleaner renewable energy by 2035 and helping the Athens community transition by 2050 through example and through uh, also uh, programs and assistance. But we can't do it alone. Uh, your voice, your thoughts, and your active engagement throughout this effort are critical. The effort's going to take each of us and every one of us. So your your participation, uh, your input, uh, your voice, it, it not only helps shape the plan to come, but it really is critical if transformational change is to be achieved. Next slide. A little bit about the uh, sustainability office. We were created in 2017. The office brings together social, economic, and ecological resources to foster long-term sustainability in the community. We're also in, involved in strategic and master planning, and we provide technical information, resources, restoration, work days, and educational events and programs. We create educational materials and resources, and if you go to our webpage, you'll see quite a bit of that that, that has been posted there, including five educational uh, modules on the energy ecosystem, which is a, a lot of fun. Uh, and somewhat complex to get into, but certainly is understandable. Next slide, please. So some of the major areas that offer the office is currently engaged in, in um, on energy include solar and other clean and renewable fuels. You can see some examples of uh, where we put up solar panels and a variety of ACC facilities. We also look at efficiency in buildings of the built environment. We're uh, examining fleet transformation as we move cars toward hybrids and EVs and even um, hydrogen gas. And we look at green infrastructure. Some other examples on the next slide are uh, in the area of ecological resource management, where we're doing habitat restoration, native planting, invasive plant removal, biodiversity enhancement, and ecosystem services preservation and conservation. We also do green space and natural area uh, evaluation and acquisition. On the next slide, you'll see some other conservation uh, areas that we 
are into. So the main ones are energy and ecological management at this point, but we also look at water conservation, aquatic ecosystems, which we're where we're looking at flooding and floodplains, trash and pollution and food availability. There's many more we want to get into as our bandwidth and capacity increases. I will call attention to the left hand side. We have an interesting pilot project is called a trash trap where we're looking at removal of trash straight out of the streams, capturing it before it gets into the rivers and then on down to the oceans. Uh, we've removed several uh, couple of hundred pounds out of the uh, Trail Creek and a small tributary off the off of MLK with that project. Uh, the lower one is a gas on the right hand side. That's the gas recapture out of the landfill. And then the right is one of our hybrid buses. Next slide, please. So the goals for today, what we want to talk about uh, at the town hall today is we want to share what we're doing with our clean energy goals, answer some questions, and primarily and focus on listening to we because this is a chance where we get to hear what the community is saying. And the more people who speak, the better the plan will be. So that's what we're really here today to do is to try to listen, uh, answer questions that you may have and, and capture your ideas and thoughts. Next slide, please. As we move through the rest of the meeting, please keep the questions you see here in mind as they go through the presentations. Uh, that's the kind of thing we're, we're these are these are conservation cons conversation starters. Uh, and we intend these to help prompt discussion. But the most important outcome of today's meeting is that we'll be able to hear from you and your voice matters and what you share now and into the future will help guide the transformation of the community as we move forward to a more sustainable and healthier future. So with the next slide, let me turn it over to Megan O'Neill, who's with the South Face Institute, and she'll go through the agenda. And thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight and for being willing to spend your time and give us your information and your thoughts. And Megan, to you. Thanks, Mike. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. As Mike mentioned up top, I am with a Atlanta-based organization called South Face Institute, and we've been brought on board to support the county in its clean, renewable energy planning efforts. So tonight for our agenda, we're going to go through Athens's commitment for a clean energy transition, talk through the reasons for a clean energy transition, and walk through the local context of opportunities and where we're working from today. So next step, next slide. All right, so athens Clark County has established two distinct goals when we're talking about a transition to 100% clean and renewable energy. So this slide outlines a goal that applies specifically to ACC unified government covering assets that this county owns, including city hall, water treatment plants, government buildings, fire stations, police precincts, and otherwise. And for these facilities, they, by the year 2035, will obtain 100% of the energy needs from clean and renewable energy sources that are produced on or for ACC Gov properties. And by the year 2050, they'll decrease the use of third party renewable energy certificates to not more than 40% of the total portfolio. Next slide. The second goal covered within this 100% clean renewable energy transition applies community wide. So that's to all buildings in the county. And by the year 2035, the goal is to obtain 100% of electricity needs from clean and renewable energy sources and by the year 2050 to have all other energy needs met by 100% clean renewable energy sources. Next slide. So when I use the term clean and renewable energy, I want to make clear what we're talking about in this context, because there are a lot of different definitions out there used in different jurisdictions or by different people, depending on the context. So for athens Clark County, Today's definition of clean renewable energy refers to energy produced by or energy saved through energy efficiency or energy produced through solar power, wind power, hydropower, energy storage, which refers to battery storage, renewable energy credits, and what is not included are nuclear power, biomass, natural gas, and coal. So this, these targets that we laid out on previous slides refer to year 2035 and 2050. Those targets are far into the future and we're cognizant that in the years to come, there may be new technologies that 
come on the market that are other viable pathways to achieve clean energy or that some of these options that aren't currently appealing now may become appealing in the years to come due to changes in circumstances. And because this is a long-term goal, there is over the years going to be opportunities to reassess this definition. But for today's purposes, this is the definition of clean and renewable energy that we will use. Next slide. So how was this goal to transition to 100% clean and renewable energy in Athens made? It really began as a grassroots movement spurred by 100% Athens, a local organization that led a series of discussion forums around environmental issues and built a strong campaign to help get in front of elected officials and really motivate this goal to come to fruition as a formal commitment that the county undertook. So on the next slide, the county passed a 100% clean and renewable energy resolution, which formally commits Athens Clark County to this transition. And it's an interesting piece of legislation in that it really prioritizes community benefits as a goal to be achieved through this transition, which to a degree that you don't typically see other jurisdictions undertake. And so one excerpt here is just these efforts will work in a manner to redress historical inequities in our priority or in our community by prioritizing resources to train and hire people from within marginalized communities to participate in the energy efficiency and renewable energy workforce. Next slide. The legislation also explicitly called out the need to collaborate with surrounding communities, commit to revisiting the goals set on an ongoing basis and reassessing the feasibility of the different pathways set as well as continuing to review fossil fuel divestment strategies and employee retirement funds. Next slide. So in terms of the road to 100%, we don't have a clean energy plan yet. We are getting ready to make one and the stakeholder engagement process that we're undertaking right now is helping us shape that plan. So how did we get to where we are now and where, where are we going from here? So in May, 2019, the mayor and commission adopted that 100% resolution that I referenced. The SPLOS 2020 was ratified in late 2019. This is very important because it opened up $15.8 million of funding for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects in the county in the years to come. In March 2020, the county established the Community Energy Fund which will serve as a resource to help fund local clean energy projects in the community. And then in March of last year, the planning efforts for developing a clean energy plan officially went underway through bringing in organizations like South Face, GreenLink, and the community advisory board that Mike referenced earlier to get things moving. Next slide. So where are we now? Earlier this year, we conducted a series of stakeholder charrettes focusing on a clean energy economy, community and equity, and the intersection of natural and built environment. We have since then been conducting a series of interviews with local community and business organizations. We've executed five town halls. Today is the fifth of five. And moving into the summer, we'll put pen to paper and start writing a plan that incorporates the feedback we've received to date. Then in summer and fall, we'll go through several iterations of that plan with continued input from our community advisory board with the target date of getting the plan in front of the commission by November of this year. Next slide. And so just zooming in a bit on our current timeline, Ways that you can get engaged to help us as we move forward with getting this plan together, you can go ahead and visit us at acc.gov.com 100. That is our landing page, which provides a lot of resources on clean energy planning, clean energy generally, the education series that Maggie dropped some information on in the chat a bit earlier. You can also very importantly on that page, take the community survey, which is a brief survey that provides you with the opportunity to provide more detailed information on what you would like to see prioritized in this clean energy transition. We strongly encourage you to take it as well as for you to share the link to, to anyone you think might be interested in providing feedback 
On this site, you can also sign up for email updates so that we can keep you up to date on upcoming events or developments as we're getting this plan together and browse the online resources. Next slide. So, why clean energy? Shay on the next slide. So, energy is essential. We use it in the form of natural gas for heating and cooking, electricity for lighting and electronics, and gasoline for driving. Next slide. And where does our electricity come from in Athens? So it comes from a combination of burning fossil fuels like coal and natural gas or splitting atoms through nuclear power generation. It comes from solar energy as well as from hydropower. Next slide. And in terms of the current emissions by sector within Athens, you'll see that almost half of all carbon emissions within Athens are the result of energy used in buildings, with an additional 12% coming from industrial buildings. And the remaining 40% of emissions are the result of transportation from buses and cars. And the 100% transition goal that the county has set, that 2035 deadline of satisfying all needs through buildings, is taps into the 60% of buildings plus industrial, with the 2050 goal really getting to that 40% transportation through electrifying fleet and otherwise. Next slide. Athens Clark County has four different electricity providers on what is a super clear and intuitive map to look at, as you can see right here. Athens is served by Jackson EMC, Georgia Power. Walton EMC and Rail EMC. The fact that there are four electric utilities at play just really calls to attention the need for ongoing partnerships with these different utilities and mapping out a transition plan. Next slide. The sources of energy we use have an impact on where we live and work. So there are jobs and communities that have mines and wells. Those are in Athens necessarily. And Producing energy just has very real impacts like mountaintop removal for coal, as you can see on the bottom left image, all kinds of stormwater runoff issues associated with mining processes, and then carbon emissions generated from fossil fuel production. Next slide, for power generation. The fossil fuels and dirty energy sources that we use to create our power are exacerbating climate change and the impacts associated with it. And some of the impacts that we're seeing in Athens today include sea level rise, which while maybe Athens isn't a coastal city, at least not yet, we are seeing the impacts of that and we'll continue to see them in the years to come as a result of climate refugees and migrants that currently live in coastal communities that are going to be become less habitable unless things change. And an example of that that comes to mind pretty easily is when we talk about Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. A lot of people came to Georgia from New Orleans and never went back. We are also, as a result of climate change, seeing increased disease risk, increased incidences of Nile, West Nile virus, Zika virus that didn't used to be very common up here at all. Still not super common, but we're seeing more than we used to. Extreme weather events like very severe thunderstorms and flooding, which you might have experienced this week and rising temperatures, hotter days in summer, and poor air quality, which leads to all kinds of respiratory illnesses like asthma and heart disease. Next slide. So why clean energy? Clean energy is the benefit of creating local jobs, jobs that involve people installing solar panels on roofs or installing HVAC systems or weatherizing buildings, require people to come into the building and are by definition local jobs. Clean energy also helps improve public health through improved air quality, and it can also lead to improved buildings and housing for owners and renters. More energy efficient buildings are healthier buildings and also more affordable buildings because energy expenses are lower. Next slide. So here is a breakdown of predicted energy mix for 2035, and I welcome Matt to chime in if I explain this poorly. So on the left, the pie chart that you are seeing is what the energy mix for the year 2035 looks like in Athens if we don't change any of the existing plans that are in place. 
on the part of our electricity providers. So that would mean that 77% of all energy consumed in Athens would come from coal, gas, or nuclear power. And that 21% of energy used in Athens would come from solar with the remaining 2% coming from hydropower. In 2035, if we use all the levers at our disposal that have a financial case to be made for them, we still won't go to 100%. That is because Athens cannot regulate the full grid. Athens can regulate its building stock in a series of other things, but it can't fully control its energy destiny, meaning that it's very important to work with other stakeholders like the state of Georgia, the Georgia Public Service Commission, and their utility providers who do have the ability to make decisions to change the power supply. But assuming none of those people that we can't control don't change any of their plans, if Athens does everything it can, you can go from that original 77% fossil fuels down to 39%. And you can achieve 40% of your clean energy pathway through energy efficiency alone with the balance being met by a combination of 20% solar and 1% hydro. Right, the next slide. So let's talk about the clean energy in Athens context. And with that, I will hand things over to my colleague, Matt Cox with GreenLink Analytics. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Cox with GreenLink, as Megan mentioned, uh, we are a 501 c 3 that's also based in Atlanta that does clean energy education and research and have been a partner as a part of this uh, process. Uh, let's jump to the next slide. So this is how Georgia is currently spending its money um, on energy. So Georgia has very few natural resources um, that are developed. So almost all of our energy that's uh, fossil related is imported to the state. And so this graphic tries to show that for us. Uh, there's in exchange for those resources, we send money out, right? So we're buying that, uh, those resources. So we're spending just under $23 billion a year uh, for energy that's brought into the state. Uh, as you can see, most of that is in the form of oil or transportation, uh, but we're also spending about 5 billion on natural gas and a little under a billion on coal. Uh, if we take that, you know, from the state perspective and narrow down to Athens, um, what you see is about 500 million that's leaving Athens itself each year. And in our forecasts out to 2035, we see that number growing to about 600 million. So it increases by another 100 million in the next 15 years or so. Um, through clean energy, we obviously have the opportunity to offset some of that. So with an Energy efficiency will be reducing the total amount that's spent and consumed. Uh, and with renewables, we'll be keeping that money local. Next slide. So as a result of making those investments to keep that clean energy, uh, keep those energy dollars local, we're going to see the creation of a, a certain amount of clean jobs. And so we'll see those come in the form of HVAC. Uh, professionals, electricians, engineers, um, also program administrators. Uh, there's a certain amount of insurance folks who we're seeing come through uh, the jobs analysis. So all all of the or they'll be necessary to support the clean energy transition that's envisioned in the goal, in the resolution, the commitment. Uh, and a part of our work here will be to make sure that a lot of those employment opportunities are directed towards folks that are in kind of frontline communities. Uh, the total jobs potential that we've identified is just under 10,000 new clean energy jobs would be created through 2035. Uh, we try to put these in equivalencies. So if you do that comparatively, that's almost the size of the University of Georgia's workforce. Uh, Incomes also increase from this, so that's kind of the good news story. Um, we're seeing an additional $630 per Athens resident per year through 2035 uh, under that maximum effort scenario. 
on the next slide, we'll see some examples of work that's already underway. Um, so in Athens, uh, you have your own solar developer in AES, uh, who's done a number a number of projects, both in Athens and across the state. Uh, they won the recent Athens Solarize campaign, which is a bulk procurement uh, process that tries to bring down the cost of solar, uh, so that if you've got you know a hundred homes that all decide that they're going to do a rooftop solar installation, uh, the developer can buy buy in bulk and get a lower price for all of those participants. Uh, so Athens has done two Solarize campaigns. Uh, and AES was the uh, installer on the most recent one. Uh, Terrapin has a solar array on its rooftop uh, as well, and they've they've procured that through a third party financing organization called Cherry Street, which is another option that's available uh, that many governments use as a way to get uh, solar deployed at at no upfront cost. Uh, and then the last one we highlighted here is WNA Engineering, um, which just completed a Earthcraft-like commercial uh, property, which is South Base's own building standard. Uh, and they're also a representative that's on the Community Advisory Board. And the solar that's on their rooftop is an AES installation, so lots of folks have connections over to that to that particular property. On the next slide, we will talk about the Solarize Athens campaign. So we've now had two that have gone through that particular project, uh, program design. There's been a little over 300 participants uh, that have helped develop uh, almost half, half a megawatt of solar, new solar capacity in Athens as a result. Uh, there's also been about a little over 250 kilowatt hours of Tesla power walls deployed as well. So basically for you know each two kilowatts of solar that are getting out there, we're getting another kilowatt hour of battery storage uh, deployed in Athens through these through these programs. Uh, the other program that's listed here is the Athens Land Trust West Broad Project. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the Athens Land Trust is also a CAB member. Um, they conducted energy audits, provided education, uh, implemented energy and water conservation and efficiency uh, improvements in homes in the historically black West Broad neighborhood. Uh, it was funded by a grant from the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network and was a partnership between the land trust and the county government uh, and involved the Young Urban Builders Youth Program. It's a great example of the type of program we might be seeing more of. All right, now for the next slide. So in addition to the job creation effects, uh, we also see positive health outcomes from moving more towards a clean energy future. Uh, so and this happens, you know, for the reasons that you're seeing on the slide, you know, we're reducing emissions because we're moving away from fuel sources that that require burning. You know, there's no more combustion requirements here. Um, so that reduces our pollution. That leads to better indoor and outdoor air quality, which translates to better health outcomes. Um, so what we're showing uh, in our forecasts for Athens is an ability to produce health savings that are worth a little bit more than $300 million through 2035. So that's a cumulative number. That's, a, that's the total value of savings that we would see. Uh, and then some examples of work going on in Athens now is uh, we've got the Athens Wellbeing Project, which is a collaboration um, among several Athens, Clark County area institutional partners, community stakeholders uh, that are trying to bring meaningful data uh, that will help create more informed decision making and improvements in service delivery. Uh, and this is one of their data points up here that 9% of the county population report mold problems in the home. Uh, households that are reporting the presence of mold are 11% more, more likely to report to report asthma. Um, as you make these clean energy investments in homes, uh, you we see healthier outcomes. So healthier housing outcomes are the result. So we'd be able to reduce some of those uh, asthma cases. 
the next slide, uh, we'll talk about one of the other opportunities here with the transition is to increase uh, equity. And so this frequently gets confused with equality. So this bike example is supposed to be one, one clear way to communicate this. Um, you know, not everybody needs the same size bike to get where they want to go. Having a different kind is going to be more appropriate. Like what we want to do is give people what they need. Um, so one, one target area is just to try to get uh, more folks involved in a democratic process to improve the energy democracy of our, of our processes. So this, this conversation is a part of that um, and trying to make sure that we get more community engaged that have been excluded in the past from planning processes. Uh, energy equity itself is an effort here to see fairness in the distributions of costs and benefits. Uh, we have found that you see a, a number of benefits from this beyond just the cost of energy, reducing the cost of energy for folks. So energy burden is the percent of your income spent on uh, your utility bills. Um, but what we have found uh, locally in in parts of Georgia is just that, uh, well, energy burden itself is the number one reason that people use short-term loan products. So like title loans, that kind of thing. Uh, number one reason that they're using those is to pay utility bill. Uh, um, also that there's about a third of the population that skipped a meal or skipped filling a prescription in order to pay a utility bill uh, in the past year. And we're seeing also that energy burdens, uh, housing stock, and health outcomes are all correlated to each other. Uh, so if we're looking at a situation where we improve energy equity, we can also be leading ourselves towards a healthier population. Uh, next slide will show us specifically in Athens uh, where we have energy burden issues. Um, so the average nationally is just over 3% of your income going towards towards these energy bills. Uh, if it's over 6%, that's considered high. You're, you're basically in the top 5% nationally if you're paying more than that. Uh, if you're in paying 10% of your income towards your energy bills, that's considered severe. Uh, when we take a look at Athens in particular, one of the things that sticks out to us uh, is that the two highest energy burden neighborhoods in the entire state are in Athens. Uh, if we take a look at the county as a whole, you see we've got a 5% energy burden on average in Georgia and a little over 7%. So the standard condition of the average Athens resident uh, is to be above that high energy burden threshold. It's about three times higher than the uh, than the national average for electricity bills, for example. Uh, in the highest energy burden census tracks in Athens, uh, we have very low incomes, so just around a little over $4,000 a year. Um, but as you might expect, this is largely dominated by students from UGA. Uh, so we do see high, high energy burdens there. Um, if we go to the second highest energy burden census tracts, we get away from that student population a bit. Uh, we see a median income there of just under 10,000 a year. You have an energy burden in that in that community that's right around 20% of their income going towards their utility bills. 16% uh, of that's electric. Percent of gas, and much of that's in the downtown area. Uh, for the next slide, you will see what I said a minute ago. <laughs> so we do have, you know, these points about the uh, prescriptions or the meals, the short-term loan issue. Uh, in total, the main the main thing that we're looking for here is is an opportunity to use this kind of information to target our clean energy programs to reduce the local energy burdens. And as a result, improve energy equity outcomes in the Athens community. On the next slide, we'll see some of the ways that that can happen. Um, so some of the ways to reduce energy burden is to increase the energy efficiency of the home. Uh, some of the opportunities to do that are low and no cost measures. These may be behavioral interventions or 
programming a programmable thermostat to operate the home more optimally. Um, and those can be done without you know, any significant changes in comfort uh, for the home resident. The weatherization efforts um, are going to be things like adding insulation to the home, uh, making sure that uh, places are sealed properly so that we don't have a lot of uh, hot and cold escaping to the natural environment that's supposed to be kept in the home. Uh, and then deep retrofits are a bigger, bigger effort where we're looking at HVAC and appliances and uh, lighting retrofits, you know, everything throughout the home. Uh, each of these have a different level of effect. You know, we might see like five to 10% savings from the low cost measures. We might get 20% with the weatherization. We might be looking at a reduction of 50% from deep energy retrofits that are focused in the home. Uh, clean energy transition that focuses on both efficiency and solar uh, can provide you know, many benefits and we've just knocked through a bunch of them. So, I mean, we're, we have the ability to reduce the energy burden for folks who are struggling most with their energy bills. Uh, we can create jobs, we can stimulate the economy, we can see better health outcomes as a result, uh, and we can in increase uh, occupant comfort. And with that, I think I hand it back over to Megan. So, yes, and I think I hand it over to Maggie, if I'm not mistaken, for the next slide. You are yeah. correct. Um, so the next segment, we're going to be going over uh, the Q and A. Uh, so if you have uh, not connected your audio yet, I've given uh, everyone permission to connect their audio uh, so that they may speak if they want to. Once you do connect your audio, please make sure um, that you're muted. Uh, and when you wish to speak, if you could just say something in the chat or um, to let us know, saying like I have a question, um, then we can get a queue started for um, what questions want to be answered. Um, in order to do that, once once I've given you access to your audio, it should say um, right next to the button right here. It's going to say connect my audio, and then you will have an option to mute yourself. Um, but otherwise, uh, please utilize the chat for this next segment, and uh, we'll move on from there. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see here. We have some already pre-submitted questions. Hi everyone, my name is Bailey. I'm from South Bay, so I'm going to help us uh, facilitate this Q and A. So I'll be uh, kind of bouncing questions between our presenters here. Um, again, utilize the chat um, and utilize the unmute uh, request function that Maggie just described. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and ask um, some of the questions that have been submitted before we started here. So, two, um, two questions here are very similar um, from Broderick and Nene, and thank you guys for joining. Um, so, I'm going to, I'll read both of them. Um, they can kind of be combined. So, um, the B Green Jobs Project needs funds for local worker development programs, RE Green Jobs. Will the Sustainability Office be prepared to meet with the Green Jobs Pipeline Committee to discuss incorporation of this in uh, in line with this plan? Um, Broderick's is similar. Uh, the G Green Jobs Pipeline would like to be added in this conversation and green and jobs and energy uh, around green jobs and energy to bring racial and economic equity to future opportunities that will be created in the industry. So I'll uh, bounce that one over to Mike um, to address that yeah, question about you. connecting with that committee. Can you all hear me? So just to, um, the answer is we would love to hear from you. That's that's where we are in this part of the plan. We're gathering that information. We're trying to understand and be able to shape what the the action steps would look like. And to do that, what we do need is to have input from groups such as the Green Pipe, uh, Green Jobs Pipeline and understanding what uh, is, what are those things? What are those elements? What can be done or what do you see as being successful pathway to, to green jobs? What are those outcomes and what um, what partnerships are there? Um, Bailey, if you want to flip the questions up, or I guess whoever has the, I guess it's Maggie, flip the next, the set of questions up. 
because that's exactly what these questions are asking. And, and that is the input that we're looking for right now in this part of the plan is what does that look like as it relates to energy and, and our move toward that goal. So does that answer the question for Broderick and was it Nene? She said, uh, thank yes, you. Uh, uh, hold on, I'm about to share it in the chat. Um, I might also make an announcement. Uh, when you guys are utilizing the chat, please make sure that um, it's sending to everyone so that the panelists and other people who are attending can also see as well. Uh, currently, right now, it seems like people are just sending it to the host, which is me, and I can resend the messages if possible. I just wanted to make sure that that was noted. Um, Nene, if you want to comment back, um, you're unmuted now if you'd like to say something. Great, thank you so much, uh, Maggie, um, and thanks for addressing the question, Mike. Uh, yeah, we'd love to reach out and um, sit down with you at a table and really, you know, discuss the plan that we have already worked out and uh, talk about the structure, the timeline, um, the proposed implementation, the proposed partnerships. Uh, we already have this up and going, and so we really would like to um, sit down, harmonize, and, and integrate what we already have started, um, you know, and, and made, you know, scale it up and, and have it as part of your plan. So that, that would be great. We, um, Maggie and I'll work out a, a, a time when we can get together and you can share what you have. Uh, like I said, this is the listening part. So I don't have answers. Sure. That's fine, but uh, just so, yeah, please look out for, for an email from us. Looking we'll forward to it. Thanks, Sine. Thank you, Mike. Thanks so much. All right, so we have one in the chat here. I'll go ahead and read that uh, before we get back to the pre-submitted ones. This is from one of the two Bruce's on the call. Uh, the 2035 <laughs> seems more doable, I assume goal. The 2035 goal seems more doable because ACC can act, set priorities, et cetera. But what are the challenges and obstacles to achieving 100% ener renewable energy use by ACC? Um, I'm gonna let Matt take that one first, if that's all right. Sure. Challenges and obstacles. I'm sure everyone yeah. on this, uh, all of our presenters have something to say on that. Um, well well, I mean, I think there's going to be both in inside Athens challenges and and external ones to that. I mean, so internally, um, there's going to be you know, the ability to have a, a focus on this issue for the next 15 years, you know, because Mike was saying this is going to require a lot of activities uh, and actions by by the private sector folks, you know, people are going to have to make changes to their own homes, to their businesses. Um, it's not all, you know, just going to be driven by by government mandate <laughs> to get there. Um, so there's there's going to be a lot of work that has to go into making sure that the energy efficiency potentials, those rooftop solar potentials, uh, the transitions towards cleaner forms of transportation, that those potentials are achieved instead of just identified as well we could maybe do this um external to that you know and so that's what kind of our max case envisions is you know athens really keeping a, a real heavy focus on this topic uh the but there's all stuff happening outside of it too uh, which is why we're still looking at you know about a third there still coming from coal gas and nukes uh by 2035 in the power sector it's going to require uh, changes to happen from each of the four utilities, uh, which most of them buy an awful lot of their power from resources that either uh, Georgia Power operates or were developed by Georgia Power that they've bought some ownership stake in. Um, so those are going to need to be, you know, those, those are going to need to be things that are transitioned away from, uh, whether that's you know, done through them and their own plans and recognizing that, hey, solar is cheaper than we thought it was going to be, and we can do some solar plus storage uh, work to, to kind of address issues we thought we had before. 
um, or whether it's going to take advocacy uh, at the Public Service Commission and with the boards um, of the co-ops and the, the other utilities uh, to try to to try to help them move towards cleaner energy supplies coming into Athens. I think those are all uh, the, the most obvious barriers that we would see. Thanks, Matt. All right, Carrie's asking here, hey, Carrie, um, I'd like to know more about the status of the Clean Energy Fund, which I believe is referred to as the Community Energy Fund. Uh, this is the, a fund that Megan mentioned earlier. Uh, it was passed just prior to COVID, so I'm wondering if anything has yet been implemented. I will pass this to Mike uh, as a representative of the county, um, but I'm sure we can also um, help speak to this a little bit. So what the Clean Energy Fund did is looked at um, franchise fees involving utilities and a, they, um, franchise, um, utilities pay a franchise fees to Athens Hart County. At the time it was passed, it was 4% um, of a revenue mark uh, per year. What the Clean Energy Fund did is create an opportunity that anything above the 4% would go into a Clean Energy Fund and that the, then that the um, franchise fees would be directly hooked to, to electrical or to utility fees. So as utility fees went up, normally, let me reset, normally these franchise fees are renegotiated every 10 years. So Basically, it was 4% for 10 years. So what this did is then link all of the franchise fees directly to their cost. So as their costs go up, as their, as their bills go up, then the franchise fee goes up accordingly. And that excess money above 4% gets put into a clean energy fund for us to be able to use on clean energy projects within the community. There is a provision that that would not kick in in case there was a budget def deficit. And there's a definition in the in the policy for that, uh, and that's where we are. We we think this past year um, we might see some money coming for the first time in FY22. Uh, that we're still waiting for the end of the budget year to see, um, but it hasn't uh, come to fruition yet because of the hit that everybody took across the line. But it is in place, so it's just simply waiting for that funding trigger mechanism. That funding mechanism to trigger. So it, we're we're there. We just haven't received anything yet. Is that help, Carrie? Great question. Uh, so a question from the other Bruce uh, in this chat here. Uh, that's a resident of Winterville. Have there been any discuss discussions with the Winterville City Government about coordinating on this project? We have not. Um, they we have uh, residents from Winterville uh, who have responded back, and we've been looking at that. But um, thank you for pointing that out. So that definitely sounds like a, a place where we, that's the great thing about these listening sessions. We don't think of everything, so that's why we ask people to share, so we can we can get better at what we're doing. I also think this is a great plug for uh, sharing the survey with your community and your networks within Winterville. Um, we are tracking one of the questions for those who choose to answer it is uh, what zip code do you live and work in? Um, and when we we'd love to have, you know, a diverse uh, set of answers from across the county, including the city of Winterville. So. Do you share that link with your your winter villains? All right. <laughs> So thanks, Bruce. And and let me add to that. We haven't engaged the uh, Winterville uh, elected officials at this point. We have engaged Winterville residents, but not the city government. So that is that is something we need to to reach out to. Good clarification. Let's see. Feel free to keep um, submitting questions in the chat. I'm going to go to. We have. It looks like we have. Two more questions that have been submitted um, before uh, before the meeting. Uh, so I'll read those. One from the other. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna say Bruce. Try not to say people's last names. Just. For the um, 
a question just generally about the cost of solar farms and return on investments. So uh, the Bruce that asked that question, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask more specifically um, what you're curious about there, um, you're welcome to. But if not, I'll just kind of ping it to Matt if you want to speak a bit to um, what solar farms look like cost wise nowadays and what return on investment means for those who are willing and able to invest in those. Matt, you gonna take that one? Sure, I was just seeing if Bruce was gonna give any more color. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the the price now that we're seeing, it's a little hard to talk about what the what the straight installed costs are for most folks who aren't in the development side. So the way that it's normally discussed, or if I'm trying to communicate with other folks, would be to translate it into cents per kilowatt hour, as opposed to installed costs. But they're able, um, we see projects in Georgia at utility scale that are uh, currently being developed and brought to market uh, right at around two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which makes it among the cheapest resources um, that are available and being added to Georgia's power system. Uh, investments in those are generally handled at the utility scale are generally done by about three companies that that are winning most of the contracts that are put out there. The RFPs from uh, from our major utilities um, are are going to very large players that have uh, at least national footprints, and for two of the three, they're international developers. Uh, we do have a an active, more state focused uh, development community that will do smaller projects, generally in the one to three megawatt space that will use. Uh, farmlands that happen to have good, uh, good transmission and distribution connection points, and you'll see a more active uh, local local to Georgia developer network there. But those do see uh, higher development prices, generally more in the three and a half to four cents a kilowatt hour territory. I don't know if I covered everything, but I hope that speaks to it. And this one thing I'll expand on that Matt said this does is where the the kind of um, complexity of what we're dealing with comes into play. So if you go and take a 500 acre or even 100 acres that you want to turn into solar farms, so you go cut down 100 acres of trees to put in a solar farm, if the point is to reduce greenhouse gases and to sequester carbon, uh, and, and that's being done by reducing energy use from fossil fuels, but we've just cut down a forest. So there's this this kind of trade off of of trying to figure out what that um, what is that point? Uh, where should we be? How should we put them in? What's the cost benefit? Not only from an energy uh, standpoint, the production of electrons, but also in the cost to the environment. So this is this is what makes this such a uh, really a complex and not a simple question. Totally. Thanks, Mike. Um, all right, one last question that we have in the, the that was pre-submitted. Um, I think it's a good one um, to keep us to keep in mind, and then we'll pivot to getting some feedback from the audience if you are willing to share. Um, but this last question, pretty simple. What happens next? Uh, and I think this speaks to the timeline that Megan pulled up earlier. So Megan, I'll ping this one to you. Sure. So, and others on the panel, please chime in as well. So next steps, as I referenced, this is our fifth of five town halls. And we are going to keep on talking to people, keep meeting with stakeholders, but we are about to move into the process of, excuse me, I need to sneeze. Um, maybe I want of outlining a the plan itself and getting that written. So the plan will identify 
preferred pathways for the city to take as well as some prioritization and squaring and approaches. But a lot of that remains, I'd say most of that remains to be determined. But that's really what we're going to be digging into over the summer. And then there will be opportunities to get in front of the commission to present out the plan itself. And then the plan's laying out a vision for the future. It's not going to map out each and every individual step that's going to happen in the next several years, but it's going to get things started and provide a framework through which the county can operate in the years to come. Megan. And Carrie's question uh, that she just submitted uh, is a great follow up to that. She's wondering if uh, we've been tracking participation in these meetings and the survey and whether we think we've gotten an adequate participation to understand the wants and needs of the community. You want me to take that one? Okay. Sure, yeah. uh, we have been tracking how many people we've been reaching uh, both through well through all the different ways we've had. Um, one on one community meetings, uh, stakeholder meetings. We've had uh, many charrettes, uh, large charrettes. We've had these public town hall meetings. The survey itself, I think when we're up to 150 or so right now on surveys, do we feel like we have enough? I, I don't know that you can ever get enough, to be honest with you. I, I really think that no matter how hard we work, there are going to be places, there are going to be pockets within the community that we, we haven't adequately reached. Um, we, but that said, I think we've got a good idea. We got some good ideas that have come forth. We've got some good uh, frameworks to work with, and we will. Uh, we also have a commitment for that, for us to continually revise that. So if we, if something is overlooked, if something isn't adequately addressed, the beauty of having a broad scale involvement of businesses and community members and nonprofits and elected officials and and community as a whole who who we would we implore and delight having involved in this process that's what it's going to take for it to to really mature and um do i think we'll get it perfect the first time out of the shoot no do i think we'll get pretty darn close i hope so and uh whatever we miss then i am I will tell you personally, it's going to take us all, and I, I just appreciate the people who are committed and appreciate that you're willing to put your time and effort into it. I'm willing to put my personal time and effort into it as well, and we'll, we'll, we'll get it done at the end of the day. Thanks, Mike. Great question, Carrie. Uh, and that's a great transition. Um, you know, keep, keep uh, answer, uh, asking questions in the chat, but it's a great transition. Uh, to another part of why we're here today, which is to give you all the floor to uh, to share uh, thoughts on these questions that we'd like you to consider. Um, these are questions that we want your feedback on um, all of all of what we've learned today and in these previous town halls um, is we're taking down and making note of so that we can help shape the plan um, and shape the priorities in the plan. So I know this is a small group with us this evening and. We might have some Bueller moments here, but I'm going to some Ferris Bueller moments specifically. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and tee up these questions. Um, and again, remember you can unmute yourself if you'd, if you'd like, um, or also just uh, chime in in the chat, um, and we will take down your answers and include them when we when we move forward to writing. So um, yes, Frederick, give me one second, and you're unmuted now. Hello, can y'all hear me? Hi, we can go ahead. Awesome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for having us again on uh, this platform. Um, just want to double down on what I spoke about in previous sessions, just about the equity piece and, you know, prioritizing that, like the, the economic equity about, you know, the jobs that are going to be created um, because we want to do right by, you know, local people and, and Athenians that we do hire to install solar for some of these projects. And so, um, you know, I, I would like to prioritize a commitment to that work. Um, sometimes when, you know, I've, I've, I've observed other processes like this and they said on paper and they said verbally in meetings that they want to prioritize equity and things of that nature. But when it comes down to actually implementing that, to actually making good on that promise, it often gets watered down. And so, um, you know, I just want to reiterate that publicly 
to say that, you know, the Green Jobs Pipeline is committed to that equity, um, making sure that there are good benefits. And, you know, we want to we want to work with uh, these solar companies that will be building out this infrastructure and growing from this and, and profiting even off of the work that is to come. But we want to make sure that employees are taken care of as well. And so just oh. probably. Sorry, continue, Roderick. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was done. <laughs> so I, uh, one of the questions that come up for me is that um, we we're, we're interested in making sure that equity is um, a cornerstone in this plan moving forward. Um, my question to you then is how do you visualize our office helping in that effort? What are some of the concrete steps that we can um, implement into this that you would like to see that would that would show that would show like adequate bringing in that equity piece and making sure it's a part of this? Yeah, I can, I can give two quick examples real quick. Um, and so, you know, yeah, like Nene was saying in the chat, there are several outlined in our plan, but just on public record here tonight, I can speak to two ways. And so when you're thinking about doing a training, right, and, and creating training uh, and pipelines for this, a key piece of equity, especially when you're working with marginalized communities, is to pay people while they're in training before they start actually working. That way their bills aren't falling behind, whether it's a four week or six week training and making sure you pay them an adequate wage comparable to what they'd be making on the job. And then when you talk to companies, bringing solar companies to the table, making sure that they understand the hazard pay that's associated with getting up on the roof. Like I've done roofing work before, not in solar, in a solar capacity, but I've carried shingles up a ladder on a roof. That's hard work and it's dangerous work. And so making sure you compensate people for that with hazard pay in an equitable way. Um, and, and, you know, those are just two small examples, like making sure that those employers are at the table and they're listening and they don't, you know, try to lowball the employees that are doing the work to make this a reality for our community and for their company. And then like advocating to the mayor and commission to make sure they don't water down you know, our equity ideas and goals. And Broderick, if you and the have been working together on the outlining those, um, the information that she's sending forward to us. Yes, yes, it's been, it's been a team of us, uh, several people, um, yeah. Excellent, because that, that is, that is huge to get um, that kind of information uh into to the plan mm -hmm. yeah we, we've looked at prevailing wages from other cities and other solar companies that do this type of work um you know we don't want to set a concrete number because we understand too like over time if this lasts till 2035 inflation is going to continually rise and we want the employees uh rate to continually rise with that as well we don't want to set it at a, com a concrete number like $22 an hour, um, we want that number to be able to increase. We, we, we ideally envision it being a percentage potentially um, that the employees would make uh, on top of their benefits that and, and safety health, uh, you know, uh, health benefits. But, you know, because understanding how inflation works and, and how, you know, things go up, the cost of goods go up, you know, that also happens for, you know, our employees in Athens. The rent goes up every year by $50 or more sometimes, even without the the, the apartment complex making renovations, you know? One one of the other things that is very hard to, to uh, figure out, and if you have ideas, I think this would be great. Right now, trades are hot. I mean, people are getting paid good money. I know trades people personally who own companies that if have told me if somebody will show up, I will pay them to train them, show up, commit, be there on time, work the job that needs to be done, mm -hmm. um, being willing to do the sacrifice. This is outdoor stuff with heavy equipment. I'll train them and, and I'll, I'll put them to work right now and I'll train them to, to do the work. Uh, the the challenge is, especially for small businesses, I think, is linking to people who are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So what is that link into the community where people are willing to commit to doing the job 
that then can lead them straight to the person who's willing to give them that job. Yeah, and, so and that's, that's, I do have a, a an idea around that actually. Um, I've breached that conversation with the school district so that we can start to grow our own. And if we are successful in creating a pathway through the career academy for local high school students, and if we present it to them in a correct ways about the opportunity that it is, and also couple that with apprenticeships, right, that are aligned with local labor department standards and safety guidelines, we could really create a workforce that those employers can utilize for years to come and, 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 and put positioning our high school students in that way and then using the funds that are available at the state level through the Green New Deal and other opportunities, we can build a state-of-the-art training facility on one of the campuses. And, and for however many years, we can run that program and, 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 and churn out, you know, well-skilled skilled people, you know? And is, have you got that in the information you're sending forward? That, that is a part of that process as well. We reached out to Dr. Ramirez over at the uh, Career Academy. He's a CTAE director. And so, you know, these are some of the things that we, we've, we're already connecting dots a lot in, in a lot of these areas. And, and we're, we're putting boots on the ground, having these conversations. And we want employers to be at the table so we can talk about the wages, what an adequate wage looks like, what hazard pay, and what benefits, and what 401k or whatever else needs to go into that. And so that they can start to, to look at the budget and the prices to, to be able to set that market in a way that benefits both the employee as well as the company. So you would see one potential role for Athens Clark County as a government to to facilitate that kind of um, meetings, those kind of opportunities. Not necessarily facilitating it, but being a part of it. Yes, definitely. There are a couple of joint meetings that happen between the school district and the local government, and we we want equity to show up in those spaces and those conversations as well. I think a lot of times it's very high level talk high level speak about what the government is doing and what the school district is doing. And sometimes we overlook the minutia of what's happening to the people um, because people are, are helping those institutions operate and function. Um, and so bringing that into the discussion, I think is is warranted. And that's what the Green Jobs Pipeline has been uh, working towards. And, and I think you hit right there. It's right there. One of the things that I'm hoping myself that the plan will help um there's a lot of talk there is talk at, at the high level it's figuring out the the path into the specific that things start getting muddy um mm -hmm. and much more um complex so the more of those kind of from like i said from from source to end uh action steps that that people can submit or suggest those are those are huge to help uh, formulate the plan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you all for the opportunity. But also having stakeholders at the table like um, the Northeast Georgia, you know, Business Alliance and and Economic Justice Coalition because those are those are key to nonprofits that have a reach to certain segments of the community that often get overlooked uh, the economic justice coalition they they help develop worker cooperatives and where the workers um you know set their wages and they own part of the company it's a democratic process in the state of georgia you know worker cooperatives are still not an official recognized entity so it's set up like an llc but on paper it's described as a worker cooperative and so you know, the, like I said, the, the employees get to set their wages and benefits and they are have part ownership in that company. And I think you bring up one uh, another really, really important part is that um, our cab members, they they are a representative or a group from the community, but and there are a lot of others as well. And it takes, it's going to take having all of those partners in place and participating. So the more um, feedback and the more you can, anybody on this call or anybody um, in the community that 
can bring those groups together with us and us with them um, as we collectively try to move forward. That It's going to take more. Government can do only so much. Privates can, industry and nonprofits can only do so much, but together we can collectively do so much more. But that's been also a challenge is just bringing that kind of cohesion to, to the effort. And, and that is, of course, the the monumental thing that we're trying to do. Yeah, I can I can help with that. Thank you. Um, and to each person who does that, thank you. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Um, this is why we have these meetings so we can make these kinds of connections. I feel like we have some great um, follow up points. Um, all right. Um, I forget exactly where I was at um, because it was such a great discussion. So I guess I guess we're opening it up to these other questions. Um, one thing that we've talked about here is equity and, um, and an equitable workforce. What else uh, are priorities uh, for this plan? And I'll I'll just go through these questions um, since it's a small group here. So what what priorities do we want to see? What clean energy resources do we want to prioritize to use the most? Um, and then what does success look like and how do we measure success? And all of those that you guys want to speak up on. Happy to hear it, happy to see it in the chat. I'm really interested. Um... And curious, what what do people what do people see as success, and how is that measured? Is it every you know is it is it money? Is it money off your bill? Is it my house is more comfortable? Is it so what what does that look like? Just out of cur you know it's really a curiosity of what what is driving each person. What would be the driving factor for each person here? Hey, Michael, can I call you out and ask you? You can throw things at me later, Michael. He won't even answer me. That's what. <laughs> He's getting really frustrated. He's trying. Oh, uh, he's saying I have to unmute him. Maggie, can you <laughs> unmute Michael? I'll talk to, Matt, to Maggie about that one. <laughs> Yeah, you can call me out, but you, you got to give me the opportunity to respond. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, one of the biggest challenges we face in Athens is that we have a lot of people that are living in in housing that for a lot of us, we would have trouble believing that it happens in our community. And, and so for me, that's what success looks like. Unlike, you know, electrification that happened in this country where some people were, you know, five decades behind other people in getting electricity, you know, I would like to see our community prioritizing the folks that have the least and need it the most, you know, up front. So thank you. All right, Carrie, I know you got something. I will call you out on that one. Is she unmuted, Maggie? Yeah, I just unmuted her if she wants to speak. Hey, yeah, um, well, first I saw that Petrina Huff had some good um, comments in the chat. I wanna make sure everybody saw that. Uh, oh, thanks for flagging. I haven't seen it. She just uh, put it in. I'm also not seeing that. Katrina, we'd love to hear what you have to say. You might be uh, directing your uh, chat accidentally to the wrong person or people. So if you click to in the chat box, you can resend it to the host, the presenter, all the presenters, all the panelists, everyone. Um, yeah, Carrie, I can I can unmute Katrina um, also as well. Okay. If you just give me a second. 
Yeah, and y'all feel free to come back to me. Mike knows I always have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Katrina, how are you doing today? Hmm. No pressure. See, I called Carrie out because I knew I wouldn't embarrass her. I, I, I thought about calling on you, Petrina, but I was afraid I'd embarrass you some because some people would just really hate to speak on the on a web call. Carrie, if you wouldn't mind, if you could, yeah, I'm happy to. I just want. I just think Petrina has really good ideas. She says there there may have to be a companion program like the city encouraging home ownership or or electric vehicle ownership. Um, and, uh, you know, just pointing out that that home ownership is a is a challenge for many people and and that that's wrapped up in this. So, um, if you all want to speak on that, and then I can have my turn. Well, I will I will share this with you. One of the most com one of the big complex uh, questions that I personally, again, would be delighted if somebody has an answer to this, is the uh, pull and pull, a push between renter and uh, owner, where the owner is expected to, or needs to be the one who puts out the capital, uh, uh, for which usually the renter is the one reaping, quote, reaping the benefits, or the opposite way to look at it is the owner doesn't do anything because they don't care because However much money the renter spends on energy doesn't matter to them. So how do we make that work so that a $900 energy bill is not going out through somebody's windows and doors and floor when and you can't get the owner to to commit to make changes because they or the renter feels like they're afraid the rent will be raised if the energy if those things are done. So this whole big question wrapped up that's true whether it's a business or it's an individual. Uh, that is that is really a, a complex question of creating a win-win for both sides in this kind of environment. So that goes to the ownership question that Petrina also talked about, which is great, and I like the idea with the EV cars as well. So if we can, can capture those thoughts as, as part of this. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I don't. I, I kind of agree with what Bruce is saying in the in the chat that like the there's going to be different parts of these goals that appeal to different people, um, and I think you, I think to continue getting a picture of what that means to everybody, it's just like going to be that ongoing conversation that Mike talked about. Um, what. It, just thinking immediately about like the plan and and like question number four specifically, I think that's really important to keep in mind. You know the specifics that Broderick was talking about, um, and you know I think like making sure that you have as specific as possible um, build outs of what each of these broad goals means. Um, and another thing that. I think would be important to include in the plan and to have published in the plan is some kind of approximate timeline. I know that there's not going to be, I know that there, that this being such a complex problem, you're not going to lay out like, here's what we're going to do in year one, here's what we're going to do in year two, but to give an approximate timeline of when, when actions should be taken um, in order to meet the goal and I'm thinking of it in terms of like new city, a new city official coming in needs to be able to open up this plan and have an idea of what's been done and what needs to come next. Um, because if you create this awesome plan in 2021 and, you know, maybe it's passed and it's public in 2022, uh, you want to make sure that it's still alive and relevant in 2025 and 2028 and 2030 and that there and I think having a, having as specific as possible timelines and goals um, so that you so that there's like a map 
of how to get there as much as possible to create and and you know to co to continue revising it. But I would want to see that in the goal, and I would feel like if you had that in place, then you would have a much better chance of measuring um, success for all those metrics. That's a very well taken point. Carrie, and I'd love to have Matt say something on that. So uh, one of the other pieces that we're developing based off of these conversations, um, as, as well as some of the scoring and the analysis that's gone into the, to the work streams already is the development of a clean energy policy toolkit. And it's going to take a look at a little over 50 different policy options, the intent is to be comprehensive um, with that and be able to score them all on feasibility, impact, uh, equity, economic development, and cost effectiveness, and use a lot of these conversations to help assign a weight to each of those areas. And once we have that all pulled together, there'll be a score produced for each policy option will help us say, these ones all look like the great ideas that we should be running with. First, these align with the public values. These are going to help us get closer to the public interest that we're trying to see. And these ideas look really bad and we're not going to go down those paths. Um, but it's going to help us create that kind of priority list like you just laid out. You know, it's not going to say in 2025 do X and in 2026 do Y. Um, but it will help organize our thinking and say these are the, the priorities. These are the policy options that help us achieve those priorities and move us towards achieving the 2035 and the 2050 goals. And then, like Mike was saying, you know, we're going to reassess these. Um, so we're going to be taking a look, you know, in the future and saying, like, are these still the right priorities? Is this still the right mix? As a, it does become a process of iteration, but we'll have that first iteration uh, produced, you know, this year. Uh, Bailey, I think you're muted. Sorry. And Michael asks, is there, are those going to be a list of things going to, is the list going to identify things that we can do in Georgia and those things which need to allow our state for change? Because that, that, you know, that, yeah, that's a great point, Michael. There'll be things we can do locally. What do we need to be doing at the state level? Yeah, I think it's, or I guess the question is about the list, but so I'll hand it over to Matt and Mitt. But one thing that we do want to make sure we absolutely make clear within the plan document is what Athens has the ability to do on its own and what it would have to work with the state or the federal government to change. And so we will make sure to call out those limitations with which we're working. And then the only thing I would add to that is that there's going to be some, so it, really does focus on things that can happen within Athens, but some of those do require um, support or will touch on things that, that happen at the state level. So things like building code amendments, uh, you know, those are going to be things that we've got. Uh, we're nominally a home rule state, but you see the, the state government itself intervene in that process. And say, you know, local governments can do certain things, but they can't do other other things uh, around energy code or around code in general. Uh, and so, like, those are going to be items that will say, you know, the plan will call out. We can push things forward to a certain to a certain level, um, but if you were interested in something like a an energy code that promoted full electrification of new buildings, you know, we just had a a bill passed through the Georgia legislature this session that um, will say that that's actually not something that local governments should have the authority to do. And if that's signed into law, then uh, local governments will be preempted from taking that step. So those kinds of things are going to be dynamics that we will have to take into account. All right. And on that note, it's a great question. Um, uh, and on that note, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Megan here to wrap us up. I uh, just want to say my own personal thank you as a former, I guess, once an Athenian, always Athenian, but as a former Athenian, um, this plan is near and dear to my heart. So it's great to see this participation. 
So thank you all so much for your feedback. Um, and I'll pivot it to Megan to wrap us up here. Sure. Thanks, Bailey. So on the next slide, you can see what's next after this. So share this recording is going to be posted online along with the each of the recordings of the four previous town halls. After this presentation, we will send you the post event survey as well as a PDF of this slide deck and a link to the community survey that I referenced earlier on in the presentation. Please do complete that survey, send it to everyone you know, and we welcome any and all feedback and you can contact Mike and Maggie at the contact information you'll see on this slide. And I'll hand things over to Mike for any closing remarks. Again, thank you all. Uh, this is a beginning uh, for, for transformational change. It, it starts with a small group of people as this has, and that then grows from there, but it has to be nurtured by each one of us. So thank you for being here and for being part of the process to get it started. Let's just keep it growing and we can make a, a huge difference. So thank you again, and please feel free to reach out to share comments to send uh, information to Maggie and I um, that's and we 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 love it so thank you very much and just to reaffirm um, Roderick and uh, Nene and uh, Carrie we will be following up to talk more about the green job pipelines uh, expect an email from us shortly so we can start making those connections Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks, y'all. Yes, and please send it to everybody you know, the survey. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And with that we can end the stream. Is that just you and me? Are you through streaming? It's uh not quite. Give me one I'm second. Here still. <laughs> I am still here. <laughs> who who is here? Uh, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Michael. <laughs> oh Michael's here. Hi Michael. I'm still... and Bruce is still here. <laughs> um well, was... it... so I had I in the chat before things got going, I I had wanted to reach out and ask about um, having the green jobs pipeline folk present to the cab because we had a meeting with them that Amy Kassain joined in on, and mm -hmm. and I, I think it would be interesting to share that with the entire cab just to give them a perspective on on kind of what what work they're already doing in the community. I mean, I, I understand you may be doing a listening session with them, and I think that's a good idea, but I also think that it would be worthwhile to, because because though we've touched on that, there hasn't been a real concrete conversation about what that could look like in the community in the CAB meetings, and I think that this, that could provide that. So let me let me ask one question, because this was kind of the, the, the part I wanted to figure out. Philosophically, I don't have a problem, but are we going to run into any issues with having other groups feel like somehow they were not given that same opportunity to present to the cab? And, you know, I, I, I worry a little bit about that kind of precedent. Yeah. I, so what, I, do, what do you think? Well, so it, it kind of, I, I'm not sure that I, I'm that concerned about that, but I, I do think, to today during this presentation when um, Megan was showing excerpts from the resolution, like some of those things, you know, jogged my memory. And and there is specifically in the resolution um, a, a segment that talks about um, equitable jobs, mm -hmm. training within our community. And, and so it seems as though it is something that is that is built right out of that, as opposed to other things that are kind of related. And you know, because energy touches our entire economy, and of course everyone is involved. Um, this one seems to be specifically called out in the resolution as a goal of, for the community. Um, 
So I don't know. I guess that's that's a conversation for you all to have to decide whether or not you think it's some sort of preferential treatment. I, I do think that um, a lot of the information that we get back from the cab on the listing sessions becomes anonymized to the degree that I'm not sure the specificity of this particular project would come through. Okay, so as a cab member, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to make you take your Michael hat off and, and put your cab member hat on. Uh, so looking at it from that standpoint, if somebody were to walk in and say, well, I want a group to present on another topic, what would your reaction be um, given the restraints of the cab? Um, my, I guess my reaction is that we, our cab meetings have generally not filled the full time. Um, they have been an hour to an hour and 15. There seems to be time and I think the more, the more information and the more we hear directly that way um, is, is actually a, a positive thing. So if, if some other group wanted to do that, I think that that's a, that's a positive, that's a, that would be a positive thing for the cab. Um, so, so if they, if they, you would see it is if they had enough desire to actually might reach out, then, then they ought to be have that chance to speak. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously that there is going to be some vetting and dis decision as to how germane it is to the, um, to the project of the cab and to the project of the plan, obviously. Um, but I think beyond that. I, I don't really necessarily have a problem with it. Um, okay. and I, I, yeah, and I think my, my guess is it's like a maybe a 20 minute thing. Like, I don't know. I think it would be kind of an add on at the end of the meeting is kind of the way I was I was considering that it could happen. So um, we could, I mean, if it was, uh, I'm thinking, thinking through this out loud. Um, so I'd hate to have a group come in and have them hang out through the whole meeting and then have their kind of shot at the end instead of saying, like, you got 15 minutes at the beginning. Oh, to, well, yeah, sure. It could be that, too. I mean, I, I, that's just kind of a out of courtesy, I guess, thinking of, uh, of them as a group. Not that you don't think of them that way either, but you're also familiar with the plan. And I know you're trying to be thoughtful of the cab as well. So. Uh, so maybe maybe something like a 15 minute presentation tell us what what this what your vision of this job green pipeline looks like mm -hmm. and and i guess you know the more i think about it i i, I don't see any real pitfalls the the one thing i don't want to build up is an as an expectation that government can do some things with jobs that government can't do you well know I mean? so and and what i what i think the way the reason I think that this is this is actually good um, with you saying that is that they're actually I mean in our conversation with them they're not really looking for government to do much of anything um, you know they're trying to build this network where um, you know as Broderick was talking about discussions within the school district to set up programs or sort of leverage programs that already exist um, discussions with uh, the Economic Justice Coalition to um, have a worker center that can be an advocate for workers and can, you know, um, can argue for the benefits that they would like to see. So, so they're, they're, it's really kind of, um, you know, civil society work. It's really not, they're not looking at government work other than I think that they would like to see the athens Clark County government as an ally and supporter in that when this gets put together that they would that the athens Clark County government would be a government that would that would um, that would you know support the goals of what they you know are promoting you know which is essentially kind of worker equity so and the, I hear that. The the thing that I have to be careful of, just for me personally or, or me professionally, is that is a uh, is kind of understanding the role that the sustainability office plays versus the elected officials play. Oh yeah um, yeah yeah. 
So that that's the delicate dance. And I know people feel like, you know, you're just dancing around bullshit. You know what I mean? They 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 feel like you're just playing with them. And it's not. It's just like that's that's policy I, against separated out. So So Mike, I feel like if we impress onto um the group jobs pipeline that this is an informational session in which they're presenting like uh like they're also idea information as to what's already what infrastructure is already building up in the community um that will probably inspire some of the cab members to see what kind of co like connections like partners can make and what kind of resources might be available i think so, yeah, i think you're right i think you're right maggie and and that part of it i'm not afraid of just saying i'm not concerned with saying you know hey come in and give us an informational uh overview mm -hmm. um, i don't want the group the the coalition to somehow think that 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 means it's going to necessarily be put into the plan in that way it, it some parts of it might be all of it might be i don't know yet mm -hmm. but I, I don't i just don't want to build up undo you see, I, I don't want to disappoint they have put so much heart and soul into this uh and they are pushing so hard the last thing they need is, a, is somebody from the government giving them lip service or what appears to be lip service and they don't follow through I, I try to live by the under under promise and over deliver uh kind of philosophy and i just don't know what that is right now so i really i'm on i'm being honest i don't i i'm trying to understand what that line looks like right now mm -hmm. yeah does that I, make I, sense yeah I, I think it does and and i i I fully understand uh, the division between the elected side of our government and our the administrative side of our government, um, and and I I don't think that that is clear to everyone, um, but I I do think that um, that for the cab, <clears throat> speaking as a cab member, um, a lo a lot of these statements are very vague. We talk about things, and, and you said it today. We talk about things at this level where it's it's relatively easy to understand what you're talking about. But then <clears throat> when you get down on the ground and say, "Okay, well, what does that actually mean in Athens, and how do we do that?" I think this is an example of a way that that we you can take that thing. We have this lofty statement in the resolution and we can say, OK, here's a group that's working on exactly this thing. This is kind of what this could look like. I, I think that that's kind of uh, that. That's all I see it as really. OK, and you're feeling pretty comfortable. I mean, you've seen have you seen you've seen their information, I assume. And I have. And, and so so I'll say this. I, I think that at this point it is. Um, it's it's relatively um, like they, they have a lot of stuff going on and it's relatively scattered and this the, the strongest part of their focus has of their work has been sort of trying to network these pieces together where they're talking about um, you know training programs for young people and putting that into a pipeline where they are negotiating with um, with employers kind of as quasi representatives or at least putting together a framework where you know these trained people young people can can move into employment and there's an understanding on all parties as to what that would mean and and that's not that is not fully formed yet um but i i do think it is at least a a glimmer of what it could be moving forward so, do you do you have a sense that um that there's a openness to understanding. I mean, you said you understand, you could see that not everybody understands that divide between policy and administration. Do you have a sense that as we go forward, there'll be a openness to understanding when we say those things that we're not trying to, we're not trying to pull punches and we're not trying to dodge. It's just really the limitations that you know, for, and, and let me give you an example of what pops to mind. You know, on one hand, we have an economic development group that's that's working with business, uh, trying to bring business in and promote businesses and things like that. And some of these are businesses are doing tremendously good clean and renewable energy things. Um, they, and then they, they, what they're going to be careful of as the administration is having that same group who would be the primary executor of those kind of things get trapped in a situation where they're also advocating for the other side, telling the businesses, 
you know, what wages to pay and things like that, they would they would have to step out of that discussion. Does but that would could be perceived as well, you're you're not walking the walk, you know, you you say you're supporting workers and you say you're supporting, but you're really not. So am I making sense or am I just babbling at this point? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, I I I, I get that. So I think that um that there is um, at least in our conversation with the group, there there's an understanding of the limitations of what what government can do. So, you know, in especially in Georgia, where um, you know labor protections are um, not as strong as they are um, in other states. Um, you know, Athens Clark County obviously has control over their own workers and they can set policies for their own workers. There, there was right. a clear understanding of that and, and there was experience with some of the members like they have a, um, a person that actually comes up from Atlanta that's working with the group who did work in Conyers or something where they had had forged some project with the school district and then it all fell apart because of some you know state preemption law you know with labor and so and so there's at least experience and understanding with that um, as far as people being disappointed that um, that you know the government can't do what they think they are going to do I would say that any any good community activist, um, you know, when they learn that first disappointment, you know, they dust themselves off and look for another route. Um, and I think that that that's not necessarily any of our jobs um, to uh, to um, pushing someone from that 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 disillusionment. <laughs> You know, I mean, right. you have to you have to learn that at some point, and 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 like I said, I think I think that this this group is has been around enough that they're they're relatively sophisticated, and 